words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be to the greater honor and glory of God. Amen. So I have a question for you to start off this morning. When was the last time you took a huge risk? When was the last time you took a leap of faith? Now, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, military people who, you know, risk their lives or firefighters or, you know, I'm just talking about kind of us everyday people. How did that turn out when you took that risk or that leap of faith? When you tried something outside the box, tried something new and different, how, how did that turn out? Was it successful? Or was it a failure? I know in my life I've had both whenever I stepped outside of my comfort zone. I remember asking a, a beautiful young woman to go out on a picnic with me. And that and the whole time that I was going to ask her, I kept saying to myself, better to have loved and lost than never loved at all. Better to have loved and lost than never loved at all. And to my surprise, she said yes. I had no idea why she said yes a second time or a third time, but she kept saying yes. And she still says yes to this day. Then I remember when uh, it wasn't long after Dylan was born that um, there was something wrong in his body and uh, he needed to have surgery. And we took him up to Riley Hospital in Indianapolis and uh, the surgeon came out and uh, started talking about all the things that could go wrong in the surgery and uh, that even, you know, that he could die. And yet, it was everything that I could do to want to hand this little infant over to the doctor thinking, okay, I sure hope I get him back alive. Well, that worked out okay, but that was rough. And then the biggest risk of all stepping out of my comfort zone was one Sunday afternoon telling Lydia that I wanted to go back to school, go to seminary, and become a priest. I'm not sure if that's a success yet or not, or <laughs> I say so. that's still kind of open-ended on that one. I bring these up because in today's gospel, we have two people that have taken a great leap of faith we have heard the phrase many times, desperate times call for desperate measures. When you're at your wit's ends and, and nothing else, you have to try, take a risk, try something, take that leap of faith. First of all, we have Jairus, who we're told very upfront is a leader of the synagogue. And this is a point in time where Jesus is starting to stir up trouble and the Jewish authorities are starting to, you know, criticize him for healing on the Sabbath and and uh, and teaching with this power that and so threatening them, threatening their power and their authority. But Jairus, he has this 12-year-old daughter who is, you know, is sick, is sick to the point of death, as the gospel tells us, and yet. Because he is so desperate, he comes to Jesus, he risks his, his, uh, his own well-being, which at that time, in ancient times, you know, it was life and death. Your reputation was important. If you, if you had to maintain that great reputation. If you lost it, you could lose everything and, and be dropped into a lower class. So I, I want to just point out how great a risk this was that he was taking. And then in this crowd, in public, uh, you know, a synagogue leader to, to lay practically prostrate in front of Jesus, to, which was a sign of, I'm inferior, you are superior, I know that you can make my daughter well, come and do so. And so, you know, he has, has abased himself and showing that, in a sense, Jesus is greater than all of the Jewish authorities and their power, because, you know, he did, Jairus didn't go to them to heal his daughter. Then we have, in the midst of this, of Jesus going to heal Jairus' daughter, we have this woman, we're told, who had had a bleeding disorder 
for 12 years. And I was reading a commentary uh, by two gentlemen. It's a social commentary on the Bible by Bruce Molina and Richard Borbach. I gotta give them credit. But they looked at this woman and there inferred some social things about her that she must have come from an elite class of people. She must have been of the upper class because she had enough money and enough wealth to, uh, to when she got this illness, this uh, disease or whatever, infirmity, to go to physician after physician and paying them off to try to find a cure. She was getting more and more desperate. And so she had this wealth, but also that because of, back in those days, women didn't necessarily have the authority to, uh, to do transactions of this kind. They kind of needed a man or an older son or something to uh, help them out in financial matters. That she was probably a widow. She was all by herself. So she lost everything. She had lost her husband and she was just desperate. And you've got to remember that because of this bleeding disorder, that she was an outcast. She was uh, unclean, unclean, she would have to tell people. In the book, she would have to be outside of society. She couldn't get close to people. And yet she risks that. She takes that leap of faith. And she risks even the possibility of being stoned to death for what she had done and being among these people. But she had that faith that if I can just get close enough to touch his cloak, that maybe I can be healed. And she does that, and she gets healed. Jesus, so this shows that Jesus has greater power than even all of the earthly positions and the knowledge that they had. But yet, it's interesting that this would have, her touching Jesus like this would have made Jesus unclean. And Jairus at that point could have said, well, what, well, wait a minute, now you're unclean, I can't have you in my house because then I'll be unclean. But it was at that point, Jairus says, no, we must go on, especially when uh, his great faith was such that when the people came and said, your daughter is dead, you know, no bother having him come in the house, that would have made him unclean even, even again. And, but he takes Jesus, goes ahead, because that's who he is. But there's kind of what I call a cover-up going on here, because uh, Jesus, they're saying that this girl is dead, and Jesus says, no, they're just sleeping. And he puts them outside, and only takes the mother and father, and Peter, James, and John's with them. And then after the, the child is raised from, uh, from the dead, that he says, tell no one. And because he, his time isn't quite yet uh, for him to, to die, because it was in the raising of Lazarus that that was the catalyst that brought about Jesus' uh, crucifixion, his death, and his resurrection. And yet God had... That was not part of God's plan yet. So having given you all of this background information, what could we take away from these two stories of people taking risks, of taking leaps of faith? I was reminded of, in childhood, hearing the legend of Ponce de Leon, who supposedly uh, a Spanish explorer who had uh, went to the Caribbean and Florida and supposedly looking for this fountain of youth uh, and that time looking for something to bring about immortality and eternal life. I'm recalling uh, back in the old days of the old snake oil salesman and they haven't gone away. They've just gone to commercials on TV. Uh, uh, Lydia and I joke when we see all these commercials, especially at our age, if we take, you know, balance and nature and relaxium and, and all these other things, you know, we're just, we'll just they have to be this fountain of youth and all of our aches and pains and troubles will go away. 
But like the woman, you could, we could all spend all that we have on these things, and yet death will still come to us at some point in time. It's not going to take away our humanness and our brokenness and, uh, and, and eventual death. Not that I want to be morbid or anything like that. The other thing that we can take away from this is that there were two healings that took place. One is the woman with hemorrhages and then the daughter being raised. But healing comes in many forms. And what both of these people had happened to them is that they had been restored. There was restoration that took place. And both of those, like I said, they come in many forms. We can't take away that brokenness and our humanness and the aging process. But Jesus sought to bring about and restore their human dignity uh, to continue. This woman, now that she was cured, was able to go and live a normal life. And thirdly, bad things do happen to good people. We know that. We all at some point will have calamities in our life and, and people die suddenly for you know maybe no reason. Uh, young, my niece, 12 years old, dying in an automobile accident. She could have had a whole life ahead of her. So when these things happen, when bad things do happen to good people, and, and we see, but yet we see other people maybe having cures or uh, maybe miracles even in life, we say, why, why not me? Why not my 12-year-old niece? Why, 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 why? But the answer in the question is, that we should be asking is, why not? Because it's really about uh, what Jesus can do. Desperate times call for desperate, desperate measures. But when that, we get to that point, can't we also say desperate times call for Jesus? 